In this episode I will focus on the front end only. I will create a React app and after a little warm up I start to build the front end interface. I won't do much styling, just a little bit with React Bootstrap and I will need a router on the front end as well, just like for the back end, that will be the React router. And I will create a local array of objects here as well, like I created on the back end for testing. I will use functional components, which means I will use the use state and later the use effect hooks. And at the end of the video, I will fetch data from the JSON placeholder website. Okay, now let's forget about the backend part for this episode and start implementing the frontend with the single page application framework called React. I have my terminal open. I'm in the Mern Fruits folder. That's where I already have the backend folder. And I'm going to have a frontend folder as well. Since I'm going to use React, I can create a new React app and a new folder in the same time by typing mpx create dash react dash app frontend enter. After the React app is created, which takes quite a long time, I enter the frontend folder and by typing npm start, the React app will start at port 3000. The browser should automatically open and that's here. This is how the starting React app looks like. I can see in the VS code that a lot of new files have been created in the front end. The entry point is the index.html file in the public folder. Here is the title, which I can change to Mern Fruit. And here the body has one single div with the ID of root. In the index.js, this react-dom.render method is called, which has two parameters. The first one is telling what to render and the second one is telling where to render it. It renders to the HTML element with the ID of root, that's the one in the index.html, and the thing it's rendering is the app component. Now in the app component, in the app.js file, there I can find everything that is being displayed in the browser. The return value is a JSX code, which is always wrapped in a single element. I can get rid of everything from here, except that I have to keep that wrapping element, and inside of that I can write, for example, an h1 tag with the message hello world, and then I can see in the browser that the beautiful React app turns into just one single string. Since I won't use the logo and the app.css, I can delete these lines here and also the actual files. To get started with React, after using backend for a while, first of all, let me create a single new component just to practice. I create it inside of the source components folder and I call it hello.js. What I do first with the new component is importing React from React and at the end I export the component with export default hello. Between those two goes the actual React component. There are two kinds of components, functional and class-based, and I'm going to use the functional one, where I can use the JSX code as a function. So here this will return with just one paragraph saying hello world. And in the app.js I import the hello component and use the hello tag. Then I can see in the browser that I have a paragraph saying hello world. And let me also use props, just like a refresher. If I want props to be passed, I can use an attribute as variable inside of the JSX. Let's say I call it props.name. And then in the app.js, I can add the name attribute to hello tag and set its value to world. In the browser then the result will be the same, but now the world can be modified without accessing the JSX code in the component. So the front end I'm about to build will contain components like this, but before creating more of those, first I want to download Bootstrap with npm install react-bootstrap, which is a great choice if I don't want my website to be ugly, but I also don't want to bother with CSS, like it has predefined button stylings, form stylings, it's responsive, it's not necessary for the app to function, but it makes it look a bit better. When I first tried to install this React Bootstrap, I got an error, and that's because I didn't have the npm installed globally. So if you're in the same situation, then try npm install dash g npm first, maybe that will help. So to get a preset CSS file, I go to bootswatch.com, where I can choose a theme. You can pick whatever you like. I chose this journal because I thought it fits to the fruity theme downloaded the CSS file and put it into the source folder. And to be able to use it, I import it into index.js before importing the index.css. And then I can implement the header, that's where the navbar will be. 
I delete the hello component, rewrite the hello tag to header, and create a header component. In the header.js, after importing React, I also import the navbar, nav, and container components from React Bootstrap. As for the navbar, I can just go to the navbar example from the React Bootstrap website and copy and paste it as a return value here. Then I need to delete the dropdown and the form tags because I'm not using them and I leave the rest. Then I make a few smaller changes. I rewrite the brand to welcome and I change one of the routes to fruit list, fruit list, and the other one will be add fruit, add new fruit. So that's how the navbar looks like at the moment. And in order to keep it more in the middle, I add the container right inside the navbar and then I go back to the website and then I can see the new look. The links in the header are now working. I can see it in the address bar, but since everything is blank, it's not a very useful feature yet. In order to make routing more convenient, I'm going to download yet another NPM package, the React Router. React Router, according to reactrouter.com, is a collection of navigational components that compose declaratively with your application. It basically helps to route different URLs to different React components. To get the React Router, I install it with npm install React Router DOM, and I also add React Router Bootstrap for the integration between React Router and React Bootstrap. My first goal with this React Router would be displaying a different text after clicking on the different links in the navbar, where each of those texts will be part of a different component. In order to do that, first in the app.js I import the so-called browser router as router and the route component from the React Router DOM. Next I need to wrap the whole return value of the app components inside of a router tag and inside of that I'm going to define the routes using the route tag and two attributes for each, the path which refers to the URL and the component which defines which component to load upon entering the given URL. For the edit fruit path, I use this column ID that will work as a placeholder. And it's important that the route of the root URL should have the exact keyword added. Otherwise, the component that belongs to this single slash in the path attribute will be visible when hitting all the other URLs as well. These four components I use as parameters, they don't exist yet. I'm about to create each of them, but before doing so, I also import them in the app.js so that later I don't have to. One will serve as the landing page, one will be the component that lists all the fruits in the database, one will consist of a form to submit the new fruits to the database, and there will be also one that allows me to edit the fruits details. And now after creating these four blank JavaScript files, they are ready to become components. And you probably noticed that the functional components look pretty much identical in the beginning, except for their names. And in VS Code, there is an extension called ES7 React Redux GraphQL React Native Snippets that allows me to create a new blank functional component with the keyword RAFCE. R is for React, FC is for functional component, A means that the function is an RO function, and E stands for export, that will include the export default component name in the last line. That's definitely a faster way to create four components. And I put an h1 tag in each of the return functions. So then this displaying text feature, which I told to be the first goal, now it's supposed to be working. And to make these h1s more in the middle, like I did with the navbar, I've wrapped these route tags inside of a container tag for which I also need to import the container component from React Bootstrap. And after all that, here we go. Now this is a very user-friendly app. And one last thing before moving on to start using local data, it's to prevent refreshing the page when I click on any of the links in the navbar, which shouldn't be happening in a single page application. For that, I can either use the link from React Router DOM or link component from React Router Bootstrap. I go to the header component, import link container from React Router Bootstrap and wrap each of these brand and link components in a link container. And instead of href attributes in those, I use two attribute and the two attribute will be in the link container. Their value will remain the same. And then if I go back to the browser, 
and start to navigate between the components, the page is not refreshing, which is good. All right, that was enough styling for a while. It's time to start working with data. In the backend, before connecting to the database, I started testing with a local variable, the array with three fruit objects, and that's what I will do first in the front end too. I'm going to go to the fruit list component and create a fruit variable with the same three fruits I used for the backend, the apple, the banana, and the carrot with an ID, a name, an amount, and an info property. And I want to list these fruits in the returning JSX. The problem is that I can't simply create and modify a variable inside of a component like that. That's exactly what React state is for. There are two ways to use states, depending if the component is functional or class-based. In the functional ones, like this one, I have to use a so-called React hook, namely the use state. My fruits array will be the parameter of the use state, and it will work as the initial state. That will be the starting value when the component renders for the first time. And this use state returns with two values, which I can define as a decomposed array. The first element is the current state value, the most recent one, which will be the fruits in my case. And the second element is the function that I can use to update the state. That's what I always need to call if I want to give a new value to the fruits. So this is how my use state will look like, and I need to import it from React to be able to use it. And in the JSX below, now I can refer to this array as fruits. It's a JavaScript expression, so I have to put it between curly braces. And now I want to list these fruits in the component. So I create a UL tag, and inside of that, I use a map function on the fruits array. For each of the array elements, I will return with their names only, not the other properties, as a list element. And I need to add the key as a list attribute to avoid the warnings. That will be the fruit ID. And that should be all. It iterates through the array, and each of the name properties will be a list element. Checking the browser, and I can see the list here. To get rid of those bullet points, I use a little inline styling. I need to set the list style type to none. That goes into double curly braces, and the none will go into quotation marks like that. And here, the list of the three fruit names without bullet points. That's all I'm doing with this in this episode, and later in the next episode I will keep the mapping with the list elements, but for the content of the fruits array, I will need to use the HTTP GET request. The next component I will start to implement is the add fruit. I'm not really adding any fruit for now, I simply create a form, which will have three label input pairs and a submit button. First, without any functionality, just an input for the fruit name, which is a required field, the amount and the info, just like that. And I can see in the browser how it looks like, but as I said, it's not doing anything. Then I add an on submit attribute to the form tag, which we'll call the handle submit function. And the handle submit function will get an event parameter. And first I call the prevent default method so that the page won't reload. On submit and I want to console.log out the fruit details given by the user. So this component will also use the use state hook since I'm going to create and handle a variable inside. That means that first I need to import use state above and then set the fruit state with the initial value of an object with an empty name, zero amount and empty info. Now I go back to the form and give a name and a value attribute to each of the input fields. The name will be simply name, amount, or info, and the value will be the value of the fruit state's name, value, and info. And finally, I also add an onChange attribute that will call the handleChange function every time there is a change in the input. And what this handleChange function does is it takes the value of the event target, the name and the value, which comes from the fruit state, and I call the setFruit function, and with the help of the spread operator, which can be used to expand existing arrays, I add the name value pair to the array, and that will give a new value to the fruit state. And then I can finally console.log the fruit's name, amount, and info like that in the handle submit function. And let's try it out. If I type some things in the form and click on submit, the same things should be displayed in the browser's developer tools. And once I have these values, after clicking on Submit, 
actually sending them to the server and adding them to the database is just one little step away and I will make that step in the next episode. The last thing I want to do by using frontend only is to request the name of an object with a specific ID. The point of that is to introduce the fetch method and the use effect hook. So this time I will get the data from the JSON placeholder .com that stores JSON data for testing purposes. In the resources I can see that it has a users array and if I click on that I can see that the users have IDs. And back here it also shows how to fetch data so I can just copy and paste this code in the fruit list after the use state. Now to use this fetch effectively I'm going to introduce another react hook, the use effect. So let me import it on the top after use state. And this use effect, it has a function that gets called every time a specific value changes. It has two parameters. The first one is the function I want to call. That's where I paste the fetch. And the second parameter is an array. And only if a value inside of that array is changing, only then will be the first parameter, the function called. And if I leave that array empty, then the function will be called only once in the very beginning. The equivalent function of use effect with an empty array that only gets called in the beginning is called component did mount, which is used for the class based components, but that's something I'm not using now. What I want now is I want to display the name of the specific user in the browser instead of listing the names of the local fruit variable. So I can get rid of these three fruits and the fruits now will be user and set user. And instead of console.logjson, I type setUserJson. And in the URL, I replace to dos to users. Then down in the JSX, the list will only have one item, namely the name of the user with the ID of one. And I can check in the browser if fetching the data has been successful. I should see one name, which is probably the name of the first user. And this was the last task I thought it's worth doing with React. The front end now is ready to connect to the back end, and in the next episode, I will make them communicate with each other so that I'll be able to do CRUD operations on the database from the front end.